So today we are going to learn about climate change, development, and globalization. So we talked about the modern world order, uh, the political world order, uh, yesterday. So today we are going to talk about the economic world order. Now remember one of the things we learned was that the United States and most of the countries of the world are liberal countries, which means they are both democratic and capitalist. Globalization is going to be a direct result of the, the capitalistic move in the world. The fact that everybody is capitalist, the fact that everyone is trading is what is going to lead to globalization. So what we learned yesterday has a direct impact on what we are learning today. We have three daily objectives. Number one, it is to define globalization, development, and climate change. Daily objective number two, explain why developing countries oppose CO2 emissions controls. And number three, argue whether globalization is good or bad. So, globalization is pretty simple. Globalization is the idea that the world is becoming ever more connected. Now this is this this when they say connected they mean in a lot of different ways. So simply using the internet and computers that has helped connect the world. So you can send a text message right now to someone in Japan and not only will they receive it in probably less than a minute but with modern translators they can both receive it and have it translated in less than a minute and they can send you a response right back. That is globalization. So people are able to communicate, or talk to, deal with, work with people all across the world. All across the world. Thanks to telecommunications advancements and new technologies. The other part of globalization is trade. International trade. Along with communication, which has expanded, global communication, global trade has also expanded. So now you've got people trading, countries trading with countries all around the world. If you look at the tag on your t-shirt, it was probably made in Vietnam or China or India or Pakistan. It was not made here. If you look at your shoes, they were probably made somewhere in Asia. If, if you've got a computer in front of you, the components came from China, they came from Africa, they came from Europe, they came from all different kinds of places. And this is a result of globalization. Now what happens when people are talking to people all across the world, and when people are trading with people all across the world, is culture is being transferred. So here in the United States, we drink Coca-Cola. Now, Coca-Cola can be drank in Africa, in the Middle East, in Japan. So that's just one example of how culture gets transferred from one place to another. And those cultures are being spread very, very, very rapidly. Many developing countries, especially in Africa and Asia, are, are dislike the fact that Western culture, specifically American culture, is starting to replace their own unique national cultures. So globalization, the fact that the world is ever more connected and people are talking and people are trading and people are learning about new cultures, has created chaos in the world, both here in the United States as well as all across the rest of the world. And what we need to understand about chaos is that in chaos, there's both opportunity for disaster as well as for success. There are winners and there are losers from this chaos that globalization has caused. So we looked at this map yesterday when we talked about developing versus developed countries. Many countries are going to be net losers of globalization. A lot of the third world countries, a lot of the developing countries, so the orange countries on this map, are losers from globalization. Now the developing countries tend to have one major goal. And they are going to try to achieve this goal via globalization. And that is to develop economies that rival the rest of the world. Put simply, they want to become advanced economies, just like the, the, the blue countries on the map. Development. 
having a better economy is going to lead to a better standard of living as well as a higher life expectancy for their citizens. So instead of five people living in a one-bedroom house, if our, if our standard of living goes up because of globalization, now we've got a four-bedroom house or a five-bedroom house. We're eating three or four times a day. We've got lots of clothes. We, we can go buy clothes anytime we want. That is standard of living. So these countries are trying to develop. They are trying to build their economies so that the average person has a better life. It's a very noble goal. But globalization is going to make that difficult for a lot of these countries. Now, where the developing countries really lose in globalization is with climate change. In order to develop, in order to get a big, awesome economy, like countries in the United countries in North America and Europe, countries are going to have to burn lots of fossil fuels, specifically coal, in their factories. These factories, when they burn coal, are going to emit CO2, carbon dioxide, into the atmosphere. They're also going to pollute their rivers and their streams and their drinking water. Thousands of people die in China every year due to the very, 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 very bad air because of all the pollutants and toxins that are dumped into the air in China every single year. And this happens across the developing world. But it doesn't just affect those countries that burn it. Burning CO2 in China doesn't just affect Chinese people. It affects everybody. And that is because it is believed by scientists that carbon dioxide is a direct cause of climate change. If we look at the map on the top, on the bottom, we see years before today. So that goes really, really far back, all the way to 400,000 years before today. On the left, we can see um, carbon dioxide in parts per million, so the amount of carbon dioxide in the air. And we can see that it kind of stays steady. It starts up near 280, goes down, goes back up, goes down, goes back up, goes down, goes back up. But it kind of it kind of sort of stays steady across hundreds of thousands of years. And then we look to today. We see 1950 level. And we see that it just completely skyrocketed past any of the other highs in recorded history. This is one of the pieces of evidence that scientists use to argue that, that climate change is, is, a, is a direct result of carbon dioxide emissions. Because this is the same time that countries across the world really start developing and industrializing and building factories. So climate change starts happening. Climate change is pretty simple. Basically, the places that are warm start getting cold and the places that are cold start getting warm. Sometimes the places that are warm get warmer. But more of the story is climate change is a bad thing. It's a bad thing. Where we are sitting right now, if, as scientists predict, and the, war, and the world continues to get warmer, it is believed that the polar ice caps will melt. All of those glaciers will melt. They will turn into water. That water will fill the oceans. And the ocean sea level will rise. And East Wake High School and everything in Wendell, North Carolina, would be underwater, specifically under the ocean, as a result of climate change. So climate change is kind of scary. It's kind of bad. People don't want it to happen. Now, it is a debate whether climate change is a result of carbon dioxide or not, but nobody wants it to happen. It is bad. So developing countries want to develop. Remember, that's their goal. But in order to develop, in order to build more factories, in order to get to where everybody else is, they've got to emit CO2 because they've got to burn fossil fuels. Developed countries, us, don't want developing countries to do that because they don't want to cause climate change. They don't want lots of people to die. We see the problem here. In order for climate change not to happen, all of these poor people in third world countries are going to have to stay poor. That is not acceptable to third world countries. The first big thing that countries around the world try to do to stop climate change is the Kyoto Protocol. And basically the Kyoto Protocol, it is a treaty that is signed in Kyoto, Japan. Um, and basically countries voluntarily sign it, and they sign it and say, we pledge to reduce carbon dioxide emissions. It happens in Japan because Japan's an island, and if the sea levels rise, Japan's probably going to go away. So the Japanese really, really don't like climate change. They're kind of terrified from it. 
Now, the countries that sign the Kyoto Protocol do it for a lot of reasons. Most of the developed countries, the advanced countries, the reason they sign it is because they want to stop and possibly reverse global warming or climate change at the same thing. The USA, who is the second largest emitter of carbon dioxide in the world, number one being China, refused to sign the protocol. We say, no, we're not going to do it. We don't completely believe that climate change is a result of carbon dioxide. Um, we like our factories. We like our jobs. It's not happening. Many third world countries, like China, sign it, but ignore it. There is no mechanism that punishes countries for ignoring the treaty. So China, who is the number one emitter of carbon dioxide, even though they sign the treaty, continues to emit carbon dioxide at ridiculously high levels without any sort of punishment. Uh, if you remember yesterday, we learned about the United Nations. If this is as big of a problem as people seem to think it is, it may would make sense for the UN to, to, to step in and get involved. Because remember, the United Nations is supposed to exist to solve the world's political problems. And this is clearly a political problem if it's going to lead to the death of hundreds of thousands of millions of people. Take about five minutes. Answer your daily objectives.